Hey! Hey! I'm Michelle. I'm Brooke. And it's World Photography Day! Yay! <laughs> it's going to be an awesome day. Thank you to everyone who's joined us all day. I know it's been a long and wild ride. Um, we got two more episodes to go. Um, thank you for joining us from all over the world. I'm seeing literally comments from every corner of the globe. Corner? Are there corners on the globe, Brooke? I don't think so. I think that's why it's a globe. <laughs> well, <laughs> people are from all over. And I see some friends from smoky Northern California. I will commiserate with you. I am in the smoke capital of California right now as well. Um, Berlin, Germany, Sweden, Slovakia, Hamburg. Ooh. We got people from literally everywhere tonight. So what time is it in all of those places? Are, are people sleeping? Wait. I feel like it's late. You're right. You should be in bed, but thank you for joining us instead. Well, That's really great. So Brooke, first and foremost, I feel like I've been following you and you have been traveling literally everywhere lately. So where have you been most recently? I've been traveling nonstop. So I was in Botswana, I guess it was about a month ago. Um, I went directly from Botswana and I'm going to tell you guys all about this trip today, the Botswana part. I went directly from Botswana to Alaska. I was in uh, South Central Alaska for a few weeks and then I went down to Southeast Alaska in Juneau for the last couple of weeks. I'm now back in Utah for like 24 hours and then I'm going up to Montana <laughs> right after this presentation where I'll be for a few more days. That's insane. So That's insane. what are you going to talk about tonight? Are you talking about your trip? Are you talking about? So I'm going to talk to you guys about my trip to Africa. It was my first ever safari. So I'm really excited to explain how totally unprepared I was in some ways, um, how totally <laughs> mind blown I was in other ways. And then I'm also, I want to make it relatable because it's not necessarily really the time where everyone's planning safari trips. So I'm going <laughs> to talk about my trip in the context of like how you can have your own little safari in your backyard um, and what sorts of photography things made me successful on that trip that could also make you successful photographing birds, animals, whatever else close to home. Awesome. Well, I'm going to get out of the way. I will be back in a little bit. At the end of Brooke's presentation, we'll do a Q&A session and I will help answer the questions while she's speaking as well in the comment section. Uh, just a reminder, as always, we are recording these episodes. So yes, if you came in late, you can definitely watch the replay when we're all done. And I'm going to let Brooke take it away if you want to make your uh, slideshow ready for me. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Again, everyone, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It makes me feel so honored every time I do one of these and there are people tuning in. I know that we all have busy lives. It's a weekday. We're all working, doing other things. So anyone who takes the time out of their day to attend a photography presentation is someone that I greatly appreciate because clearly you're passionate about your hobby or your craft or your profession. And um, you're obviously an awesome person for being interested enough to tune in today. So like I just kind of introed, we are going to go over, or we being me, I'm only one person. Don't know why I said we. I'm going to go over my trip to Africa. Um, I'm going to tell some stories. I'm going to share some of my favorite photos. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of context as to where I was and what I was doing. And then I'm going to dive into those compositional techniques that I promised, where we're going to talk about um, what made my images successful and how you can emulate the compositions that I've made in Africa when shooting in your own backyard, no matter what your subjects might be. So who the heck am I? Good question. Um, I'm Brooke Bartleson. I'm an Olympus explorer. I've been partnered with Olympus for about almost exactly two years now. Um, I'm loosely based in Utah in the United States. I say loosely because I'm never really here. This is where I get my mail and unpack and repack my suitcases. But for the most part, I am constantly traveling, following wild subjects all across wherever they happen to be active at the time. Primarily, I shoot in the GYE, which is the abbreviation for the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. So that's Yellowstone National Park, Grand Teton National Park, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and a little bit of Utah as well. Recently, I spent a lot of time in Alaska photographing brown bears. Um, and then I also migrate over to Colorado, typically in the falls. So coming up here to focus on um, elk and other autumn wildlife types of things. I've been doing wildlife photography for... I about five years now, four of which I've been doing exclusively wildlife photography. So there's really no other genre that I get too involved with. Occasionally I'll do a little bit of landscape and lifestyle, um, but really my main thing is wildlife. And why I 
this says why I wildlife, which is not good grammar. It's supposed to say why I chose wildlife. Um, I chose wildlife because it tells a great story. Um, I'm a storyteller as well as a photographer. And because conservation is such a heavy and important focus of wildlife photography, conservation, protecting our wild spaces, protecting our nature, protecting um, you know our, our richest natural resource, which is the wilderness itself has always been something I've been super passionate about. And wildlife photography was the genre that I think gets people to call it, fall in love with conservation more than any other genre um, that I've ever seen. So those are primary reasons why. Other reasons include, I just love adventure. I love a rugged lifestyle and wildlife photography really gets me close to those types of things. So a little bit about Botswana, specifically where I was in Botswana. I've added this little map here. There's a lot of information on it, but really the info that matters the most is where it says A and where it says B. So these are the two locations that I worked or worked doing photo photography at. You'll notice the first one, point A, is on the outskirts of this big green delta. This is called the Okavango Delta. This is an area that gets filled up with water after the rainy season. Uh, the water allows fresh plants to bloom after um, you know, a long, dry summer season. The time of year that I traveled to the Okavango Delta is just following that rainy season. So it was super, or it was winter's kind of coming to an end and it was starting to become more um, lush in that area. So the annual flooding brings in a lot of wildlife into this area in the Delta, a lot of really uh, incredible species that would be kind of difficult to find all in one place in other parts of the African continent are all super close to one another, coexisting in this really beautiful landscape. And then I traveled just a little bit north there to a second camp um, with similar wildlife populations, just a little bit different of a landscape. So it offered me to have the opportunity to shoot sometimes wildlife in more lush, greenish, watery areas, and then wildlife in more open, arid uh, backdrops. So just gave a little bit of variety to my trip. And I'll talk to you guys a little bit more about the specific locations um, that A and B represent. So the first one, point A, was Vumbra Plains Camp. I was there for a few days. This is the camp that's closest to the delta itself. As you can see, it sits right on the water. So this was awesome because wildlife comes to that water source to drink. There were elephants passing through the area. There were a ton of hippos really close by, which was crazy. I actually barely slept each night because I could just hear hippos making noises in the distance. And they actually, the sound that they make sounds like an evil wizard laughing weirdly enough. So it was like a strange sound to hear in the darkness and it really was difficult to get any shut eye, but what an awesome problem to have. Um, the second camp was Dumatau. So as you can see, it's also on the water, whereas um, Vumbra Plains, that waterway was a little bit more of a marsh. Dumatau was on an actual um, river. So this was moving water. It was a lot deeper. Really the only animals that were crossing the water here were elephants just because the water was so deep, it's not as much of a, a crossway um, for animal migration as my original camp, but it was absolutely spectacular. I actually had the opportunity here to photograph wildlife from a boat because we were able to follow the waterway down to some of the areas surrounding camp. And I got to photograph elephants as they were drinking right out of the river and it was just totally magical. I've never done wildlife photography from a boat before. So that was like one of the coolest things ever for me. Um, one of the best parts about this whole trip was that I really got to get educated um, by some incredible local expert guides. I do consider myself an expert in wildlife of the regions where I shoot. It's taken me years to get to the point where I would consider myself an expert. And though I say I have a lot of expertise in this area, I still obviously have a lot to learn. When I traveled to Botswana, even though I read guidebooks books beforehand, uh, watched videos beforehand, attended little conservation conferences um, surrounding the region beforehand, I still honestly had no clue. Anything aside from what species lived there, what time of year they're active, what they look like, and really that's all I knew. These guides that we had partnered with us were truly experts from the ground up. These are individuals who grew up in this area. Most of them are from communities really close to where these safari camps are located. And they've been following these wild animals since honestly the day they were born. Their lives have revolved around these wild spaces and the animals in which, um, or which habitate in those areas. My guides could look at tracks on the ground 
Identify the insects that walked over a set of lion tracks. Identify the size of the lion that left those tracks. Use the insect tracks that are crisscrossing the lion's tracks to indicate what time of day that lion probably walked through. Figure out what direction the animal was moving in and follow it through the rough terrain to get us exactly where we needed to be, to be in position to photograph these animals. I mean, it was incredibly impressive. These guides work for the um, safari camp company. They're called Wilderness Safaris. This is a company that Olympus actually has a partnership with, which is why I was there. And we had the chance to not only see Olympus's partnership with the camps themselves, but we also got the chance to see how these guides were utilizing the cameras that Olympus provided in the field, which was absolutely amazing. And we got to see some of the nonprofit efforts that Olympus and Wilderness Safaris are supporting um, along with one another. In the next few weeks, there's gonna be a lot more content coming out from this trip overall. We're actually gonna be launching, well, it's already launched, um, a photography composition or comp competition, composition, competition, it's a competition, a photography competition called Africa in Focus, which I'd like to plug really quick. Um, if any of you guys have ever photographed anything on the African content at any point in your life, you are eligible to submit those photos to this larger uh, photography competition. Like I said, it's called Africa in Focus. The photos will be judged during the fall. There's an awesome prize package. Um, you'll have to Google it. I, there's no clickable link in this just because of the way the presentation works in the streaming services, but a uh, super awesome competition, tons of great prizes. Your entry fees help support the communities where these guides are from, which is just a really nice little piece of kind of like holistic conservation and community support work that Olympus and Wilderness Safaris are doing. Um, quick note about the subjects. All of my subjects were truly fully wild. I do know that there are areas in Africa where a lot of wildlife photography occurs that are high fence areas. Um, the animals aren't really free to roam, travel across the landscape beyond where the fences line. This is not an area that is structured that way. Um, these animals are completely, absolutely wild and untamed and uncontained. It makes wildlife photography there a little bit challenging just because these animals can leave the area at their will, but it also makes it a thousand times more rewarding because these are animals that, like I said, they don't have to be there. It's an absolute honor that they choose to be and that we get to interact with them and capture their photos and watch their behavior the way that we do. Just a truly um, magical way to, to see wildlife. So question that a lot of people have asked me and were asking me while I was present is what gear did I bring along? I had to pack extremely light. Um, the planes that we took out to the camps were all small aircraft. And there were a couple of instances where we were actually flying in between locations and helicopters. So I had to pack as lightweight as I possibly could. And I actually, I don't have a picture of it here, but my, my goal for the trip was to pack my big lens and my camera and then all additional gear in just a fanny pack. So that was my main setup, what you'll see pictured here. It's my OMD EM1 Mark III paired with my 150 millimeter to 400 millimeter f4.5 TC 1.25x IS Pro. Totally a mouthful of a name, but a fantastic lens. It's Olympus's newest telephoto lens. So that's what lived on my camera for the most of the time that I was shooting. Then I brought along uh, my 40 to 150 millimeter f2.8 Pro lens just to kind of cover that earlier part of focal range that my larger lens might not be able to reach. To be honest, for the most part, I used that big white lens. There were only a few unique circumstances where I switched over to my shorter telephoto lens. Uh, that was just personal preference. I think you could have happily photographed these subjects with either lens choice, just depending on if you wanted a more portrait style image or if you wanted a more contextual kind of landscape and wildlife blend photo. And then I got to bring along um, the newest Olympus lens. It's the eight to 25 millimeter f4.0 pro lens this one was so fun to shoot some behind the scenes stuff with i did a little bit of landscape which was totally outside of my wheelhouse so i'm not going to show you guys any of that because it's not very good um i did a little bit of lifestyle so when we were flying in the small aircraft the bush planes and the helicopters i was shooting you know little behind the scenes out the windows and stuff like that with this lens it's so small and so compact that even though i don't usually prioritize landscape and lifestyle it was just nice to bring it along you know, it costs no extra weight practically to have it with me. So I'm, I'm really glad that I brought it. And that was it. That was pretty much my full kit. So 
What I'm gonna take the most time doing during this presentation is telling you guys the stories behind the photos that I've captured. Um, obviously the images themselves tell a bit of a story. That's why we do photography, at least me specifically. Um, but I think that giving you really that largest context and explaining what the challenges I faced at each moment were, will help you understand the compositional techniques that I'm also pairing with the images. So I'm gonna start out with this photo, which was one of my absolute favorites that I took during the trip. Um, let me show you my settings here. This was our first day. Actually, this was on our drive from the airport to our first safari camp. My expectations, like I think I said a little bit earlier, I was a little bit unprepared for this trip in some ways. I did my background research by looking into what species I was most likely going to encounter. But beyond that, I really didn't have much more of a clue in terms of the frequency of how much wildlife I would see and when, um, the proximity of how close I'd be able to be to wildlife, and the ease with which we may or may not find sightings. So I kind of set my bar pretty low in terms of expectations. I told myself each day I'd be lucky if I had one really good photographic opportunity. Um, that was more than I could ever consider asking for when I photograph wildlife close to home here in the lower 48 the Rocky Mountain region of the United States, it's not uncommon to spend six or seven days in the field and only come away with one good photo opportunity. So I kind of based my expectations on that. You can imagine I was absolutely mind blown and delighted when we're driving from the airport or really the airstrip, it wasn't an airport, from the airstrip to the camp. And within the first 15 minutes of the drive, we came across a herd of probably around 200 buffalo. These were Cape Buffalo, which I'd never seen before in my life. Coolest looking animals. They're probably a little bit bigger than the domestic cow cattle that you'd be used to seeing and a little bit smaller than the bison that we have out here in the Mountain West. So just an incredibly massive, beautiful animal. And there was this entire herd of them and they were on the move. So as they moved, they were kicking up this massive cloud of dust into the air. And it was really cool because it was the middle of the day. So I actually didn't even have my camera out just because typically middle of the day, I'm not used to be that being a time where you see wildlife at all. And if it is, they're usually um, bedded down. Animals like to sleep during the middle hours of the day. They're not usually super active. And from my experience, you know, when the light is that harsh, I don't even really want to be shooting at all in general. So my camera is in my bag and we come across these buffalo. They're kicking up dust. The light is streaming through the dust in the most magical way. I mean, it was absolutely beautiful. Imagine those rays that come down when the sun shines through the clouds. It was like that all over the entire herd of buffalo. And even though they were moving, they were actually moving pretty slowly towards us. So these animals are getting closer and closer. The light is just flawless. I get my camera out and I'm trying to get a photo similar to this one here but I really wanted to photograph one of the super large Cape Buffalo that was in the herd. This Buffalo, although her horns look pretty impressive, this is a female, so she's got smaller horns and her horns really aren't nearly as large or as thick as the male's horns were in that herd. Their horns were absolutely massive. Um, some of them curled almost all the way around. They had these big bases to them, these big like pummels that attached to their heads. They were just the gnarliest, most impressive things I've ever seen. And I wanted so badly to get a photo of one of those bulls. The light wasn't really working out. The bulls, they were a little bit agitated um, as the herd was moving. They were throwing their heads around a lot. They were headbutting one another. They were trying to herd the females and the calves. So they were putting their heads down and like pushing on them a little bit. And it just didn't make for the best photo opportunities. So I thought, all right, yes, that's the subject that I want the most out of this herd, but I've got 300, up to 300 animals in front of me to choose from. Find the opportunity here. Focus less on the subject and just find the best opportunity to create the best composition that you can. So after like five minutes of my just pointing my camera everywhere, my head being on too much of a swivel, not really focusing as much as I would have liked to, I saw one female that was a little bit apart from the herd closer to me. Um, and she wasn't moving as much. She was pretty wary, actually. She was keeping a really close eye on us. She kind of had a little bit of a, a lookout vibe to her. And I decided, okay, this is the animal. I'm gonna take the opportunity here to photograph the animal that's moving around the least, um, that's keeping her head up. She may not be the biggest or the most beautiful in comparison, but this is the one that I'm gonna photograph. 
And as I focused on her, you know, the light was changing pretty dynamically as these clouds of dust were passing through. The light hit her really nicely on the one side of her face. I got some images of just that. And then this, uh, this cowbird landed right on her head. It was the perfect timing. The way the light caught her eye, the way the light caught the bird's eye, the way the light caught its beak. It was just an opportunity, a moment that I completely might have missed had I been jumping from subject to subject the way that I did when I first arrived on the steam. In the end, I'm so happy with how this composition came out. And I think it's a constant reminder of one of my favorite tips. And this is a tip I give in every presentation. It's a tip I have to remind myself of daily. Be opportunistic. When you're doing wildlife photography, it's so easy to get caught up in wanting to take a picture of the biggest, most impressive subjects that you can think of. So if you're shooting in your backyard, you're probably thinking, okay, we've got foxes that come through. We've got deer that come through. Sometimes we have a black bear that visits. I wanna take a photo of that animal. If you stay too laser focused on those larger, more impressive subjects, you might miss the other opportunities that pass you by, like the time that a hummingbird visits your hummingbird fe feeder when the light is just absolutely perfect golden sunset light. Or the time that a raccoon is hanging out in your tree, peeking down on you from up above, and it's perfectly backlit by the sun as the sun is starting to rise in the morning. Or you might even miss the squirrel that pauses on your fence, fluffs itself up a little bit, and makes perfect eye contact with your camera. So just constantly reminding yourself, no matter where you're shooting or what you're shooting, to be opportunistic, see what the situation pre presents, and take the opportunity to make the most of what's being offered to you, rather than just staying too focused on trying to force the vision in your head. So this might be actually one of my all-time favorite images that I've ever had the chance to take. Um, I'd never seen baboons before, except for in the zoo. In the zoo, when you're looking at baboons, they're in this enclosed habitat where uh, the purpose of that habitat that they're enclosed in is to have people come and view them. So they're very visible. They're very easy to see. There's not a lot within their zoo habitats typically for them to blend into. In reality, Baboons have insanely good camouflage. I had no idea. We pulled up into this area, this copse of trees, and my guide pointed out, there's baboons over there. And I was looking, and it wasn't until two of the baboons started moving up the tree that I realized we were looking at a family unit of like 30 baboons right in front of me, less than 50 yards away, and I genuinely couldn't see them because of how fantastic their camouflage was. I kind of did the same thing that I did when I was photographing the buffalo, where I was just so excited that I couldn't focus. And I was pointing my camera in every direction, taking all these subpar images of baboons where you can barely tell if it's a baboon or a tree that you're looking at. Finally, I was like, okay, these images are exciting, but I need to slow down um, or I'm not going to take away anything usable from this, this moment here. So I put my camera down. I just watched them. And I watched those first two baboons that I first noticed move up the tree kept on losing sight of them uh, because they moved so so slowly and so fluidly that they blended in even when they were in, the, in motion. Finally, they started to move out towards the edge of the tree a little bit closer to where they're positioned now. And I thought to myself, if I just wait, wait for them to separate themselves from the tree to get a little bit isolated from the things that they naturally camouflage into, I might have the chance to get a really good image here. So it's exactly what I did. I got my camera into position and eventually they both scooched away from the trunk of the tree perched on this broken branch here. And then of course, I mean, it, it was just a moment of pure luck where the light hit them uh, the way that it did in that moment and, and really lit up the one's eyes there. But this exemplified um, one of my other all-time favorite compositional tips and one that I don't think I stress as much as I should when I'm teaching these sorts of presentations. And that is to focus on subject isolation when you're photographing wildlife. Like these baboons, most animals, especially prey animals, so believe it or not, despite how humanoid they seem and act, baboons are prey in their natural habitat. Lions, leopard, leopards, uh, wild dogs, they all feed on baboons. So they've developed this incredible natural camouflage. Most of the wildlife that you'd be shooting in your backyard, deer, squirrels, raccoons, um, a lot of the smaller bird life, rodents, anything like that, typically are prey animals. So they're designed to blend into their environment. They're designed as well to blend into one another. A lot of instances when I was trying to shoot these baboons, they were clinging to each other just like they are in this photo, but in a way that was distracting. Um, you'd have one baboon's face in focus 
and then another baboon's butt showing in the image. And of course, no matter how in focus and beautiful the expression on the face that's visible is, that butt is always going to detract from the overall image because, you know, it's a distracting piece of imagery. You have to wait for the moment when your subjects either step apart or both have their heads turned in a way that's appealing, um, where they're isolated from one another enough that you can tell this is two completely separate subjects, and they're isolated from their background enough where you can see exactly, easily, what the subject of the image is. It's a challenge in wildlife photography because it's not something you have control over. When you're looking at a herd of deer, you can't just tell the three deer on the right, hey, can you guys scooch over so I can get a clear shot of this other deer's face? You have to be really patient. And you do kind of have to understand your subject's behavior a little bit in order to know when that golden moment is about to occur. To be honest, I feel very lucky that I anticipated correctly that these baboons would move out to that broken branch and eventually perch there. Because honestly, I know nothing about baboons and what they do. I honestly don't even really know what they're doing in this photo. I'm not sure if this is like a mom and a baby or a couple of mates or just friends. I have no clue what's going on here. Um, so I was lucky that things happened the way I hoped they would and I anticipated that they would because that's really what allowed me to capture this image the way I did. So subject isolation is always a key component in wildlife photography. It's an easy one to forget. Try to keep it in the forefront of your mind. This was the moment I had been waiting for the entire trip. Who goes to Botswana and doesn't think of lions as the subject that they just absolutely want to get a photo of. We'd actually seen lions a couple of other times before I had this, um, this opportunity, this moment here unfold. One of the challenging things is that obviously lions are large predators. Um, they're not a safe animal to approach necessarily. They're not a safe animal to photograph on foot ever. And they're not a safe animal to get too close to um, if the lion isn't showing clear signs that it's comfortable with you. So we spent a lot of time a distance away from lions, photographing them from our safari vehicles where we were safe. Unfortunately, we had this sort of downward angle where I was shooting, you know, at these, these lions that were laying down or sitting down below me. Some of the photos came out fine because of the lion's pose and, and body positioning, but I didn't really have those super impactful um, intimate moments that I really wanted to come away with when photographing these incredibly beautiful animals that I've dreamed of seeing my entire life. This was the last lion pride that we encountered. Um, what you can't see is that in the lower left-hand corner of this image, I mean, you can kind of see it if you look really closely, there's a reddish hint of something at the base of these uh, sprigs of, of greenery. That was a buffalo carcass. This lion pride actually ended up hunting that same herd of buffalo that I'd photographed earlier in the trip. And they made a kill and they drug the kill underneath a bush. And that's where they were eating throughout the day. The bushes were pretty tall. Lions are pretty tall. They come up probably about to my chest. The bushes were just over my head. So the bushes were a good bit above the lion's heads and they created this weird shadow effect that sometimes was really nice, like in the case of this image and other times was just absolutely awful. You've got crisscrossing shadow over these animals' faces and bodies made it really hard to achieve any sort of subject isolation. And I wasn't liking most of the photos that I was getting. We hung out there for a while. We stayed put in our safari vehicle for a really long time. Eventually, these lions that at first, they weren't feeding on the buffalo carcass when we first got there. We were actually parked pretty close to the buffalo carcass while the lions were napping off in the trees, in the brush. Occasionally they'd get up, they'd go sniff at the carcass a little bit. It was the middle of the day. They weren't quite hungry yet. Uh, it, was, it was pretty warm, you know, the sun was shining directly on them, even though it was winter in Botswana, the temperatures still get pretty warm during the day. So these lions were just being quite lazy at first. We hung out a little bit longer and a little bit longer. And then a really cool thing happened and two of the cubs woke up. One thing I know about wildlife is uh, wild mamas are very protective. When their offspring start moving around and getting active, no more sleep for mom. Just like in the human world, when your kid wakes up, no more sleep for you. That's it, that's the end of that. So the cubs got up, they started uh, chewing on parts of the carcass and I knew that if I was patient, eventually one of the adult lions would arise as well. Sure enough, I don't actually know if this was their mom, but one of the female lions stood up and she approached the carcass sniffed at it a little bit. Uh, she disciplined the cubs a little bit. She was growling at them. She was snarling at them. And then she trained her attention to us. She was quite curious about the people that had been hanging out there for such a long time. 
And she moved a little bit closer. And then she moved a little bit closer again. Now at this point, she was close to the vehicle, um, not so much to where we had to feel unsafe at any point, but it was not a moment where I wanted my hands or any part of my body outside of the safari vehicle. I still really, really wanted to get an intimate portrait style photo of this moment though. So I ended up sitting on the floor in the safari vehicle and I was shooting out the little door gate thing um, in order to get eye level with this lion. I was in the craziest position. It was one of those moments where I was glad I shoot Olympus because I didn't have to wrestle with a tripod and my gear was light enough that I could just hunch over down on the floor really easily. And I got this eye level portrait with her. And it wasn't until I uploaded the photos later that I noticed she has this really unique freckle in her eye. Um, the thing that I love most about the freckle in her eye is that I also have a freckle in my right eye. So I just felt like we were like soul sisters when I looked at this image. I think I was so happy I like burst into tears. Um, and that brings me to <laughs> this tip, which is get eye level. Getting eye level with your subjects, whether it takes a whole lot of waiting or a whole lot of uncomfortable positioning, will always make for a far more intimate, more impressive image. Part of the best things about wildlife photography is the fact that with the power of a long lens, you get to show the world something you could never actually see with the naked eye. I would never actually in real life be eye to eye this close to a lion, as close as my lens is portraying me to be. Because of the trick of having a long lens, I'm able to give off the effect that this lion and I are standing face to face. Utilizing uh, your body or the back screen on your camera, you know, you can hold your camera down low, swivel your back screen up, or hold your camera up above your head and swivel your back screen down so that you can still see what's in frame in order to force that eye level perspective. I mean, it'll be worth the extra effort every single time. Especially when you're shooting an animal that has such nice eyes. Uh, funny enough, squirrels also have really beautiful eyes. So when you're shooting backlight, backyard wildlife photography, think about the subjects that have the most light catching, contrasty, compelling eyes and try to focus on getting eye level with them. Lay down in your grass, shoot a badger as it's rooting around in your, in your garden. Um, I promise you it'll make a less interesting species considerably more interesting when you can present it in such a unique, intimate way. We saw a lot of elephants, which was actually, for some reason, I don't know what planet I thought I lived on or like what I thought Botswana was like, but for some reason, I didn't think I was gonna see that many elephants. Maybe it was because I really wanted to see a lot of elephants and like, I didn't wanna get my hopes up and have my soul crushed if I didn't. So I kept my expectations super low and was like, I'll be happy if I see one singular elephant. Like that's more than a person can ask in this lifetime. Turned out my expectations were exceeded by a long shot. We saw elephants constantly. They're really big. Um, like if you've never seen an elephant, to put it into perspective, however big you're imagining to them to be, they're bigger than that. They're, they're like huge, which was really hard to photograph. I'm not used to shooting things that large. The biggest animal I usually photograph is like a bison, a bear, or a moose which are, yeah, they're big, but they're not that big. They're not towering over me. They're not the size of a, a vehicle, you know, on stilts with a long hose coming off the front of it. I was so out of my element when I was trying to photograph these elephants and my images really show it. Um, I was struggling to get eye level, especially because their eyes are so small compared to their bodies. I was struggling to compose and frame the images all that well because I didn't know their behavior I didn't know which way they were moving. I didn't know which way they were gonna swing their heads. I couldn't anticipate their positioning. They were typically traveling in herds. So a lot of my more zoomed out images, there's like 10 elephants in frame and it was super distracting because there was no subject isolation. But I wanted, you know, a, a usable, presentable image of an elephant. So I was like, you know what? I think I have to get a little bit abstract. I have to cut all of these distractions all of these things that are making my images not super um, streamlined or simple to look at and get as abstract as possible while still being, being able to show what animal I'm shooting in order to make this work. So I ended up spending a whole day where I was just zooming in as tightly as I could on different parts of the elephant. Obviously the image that ended up being the most interesting was the one where the elephant's eyes in frame. But I also took a lot of really abstract photos where I was zoomed in just on the elephant's wrinkles where you could see the shadows in their skin. I thought it told a pretty interesting story. 
some of the photos, if you really look at this photo and look at um, the wrinkles of its trunk on the lower left-hand side, and then kind of the spotted marks on its forehead in the upper left-hand side, it almost looks like a landscape viewed from above. You know, when you're like flying over a landscape, a forest or something, and you're looking straight down, the wrinkles look like the pathways that hiking trails and animals might make through the forest. And then the, the dots on its forehead look like the tops of trees or bushes. To me, what it truly looked like was looking at the Okavango Delta itself from a plane. So it ended up being the abstract images that the one, were the ones I liked the most. Um, most of my zoomed out photos, I really wasn't pleased with in the end. So that leads me to this tip, which is get abstract. If you're having a hard time presenting your subject in a compelling way, can you drop your shutter speed and take a photo of a bird with its wings blurry now? Can you zoom in really tight and take a photo of just a deer's eyes and deer have beautiful long um, eyelashes and try to make that work? Can you take a really close up photo of your dog, of a golden retriever, something that has long, beautiful fur and let that tell a little bit of a story. We don't always have to think about presenting our wild subjects in their entirety. Sometimes just a tiny little capsule of their being tells as much of a story as seeing their entire body. This isn't my usual form of photography. Getting abstract with my images is definitely something that was challenging for me. This is something I'm gonna challenge myself to do constantly going forward because I think it opens up a lot of opportunities to be unique. So this was another lion shoot. Um, this was a moment, this was actually our last lion interaction. Sorry, I said that the previous one was, but that's not correct. That was the night before. This was our last day in the area where we would be seeing lions. We got there, um, similar to the first story, we got there in the middle of the day. The lions were lazy. They were out in the open this time. It was a different pride. They didn't have a carcass. They were just napping in the middle of this grassy field. Uh, the grass was pretty tall and they didn't move for hours. Finally, they stood up. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon and they started moving around and yawning and they were up, but the light was really harsh. Um, you could see all of the grass behind them. You could barely see where the lion ended and the grass began because again, there was no subject isolation. Um, they blended so flawlessly into the background. I didn't even touch my camera. It actually got to the point where my guide asked me, are you, are you bored? Do you want to leave? You're not taking any photos. The lions are up. They're walking around. Do you want to take a picture? And I, I would take, you know, like a photo here and there, but I, I wasn't getting super into it. And I was like, listen, if we've got the time today, I really want to stay put. I really want to stay as long as we can and wait for things to get a little bit better. So we continued to wait. We waited until finally the golden hour started and the sun started to go down. It took an amazing amount of patience. Um, I have to give so much credit to my guide and to the film crew that was with me during this time because I really made them sit there for a ridiculously long amount of time because I needed that good light in order to make this photo work. I needed the subject to isolate itself from the backdrop, um, the hazy light picking up the dust particles and the dirt particles in the air finally made it so that the grass and the lion weren't just totally indistinguishable from one another. We moved the safari vehicle slowly around the lion so that the light was doing a little bit of backlighting. I guess this is more of like a side light than a backlight. And it lit up the fine hairs on her ear. It caught her one eye and made it just look like it was absolutely glowing. I mean, it was a moment where I actually had to put my camera down at one point because it was just so beautiful to see with the naked eye. I think it's easy as wildlife photographers, we all know that we have to be patient when it comes to our, our wildlife subjects. We're all used to waiting a long time for our subject to appear or to find our subject or for our subject to lift their head or start moving around. Sometimes we can get a little bit more impatient when it comes to the light. You know, I, I have a saying that I'd rather photograph a squirrel in great light than a lion in bad light. And this situation kind of just exemplified that. When the light was bad, I wasn't super interested in taking a photo because I just knew it wasn't going to live up to the expectations that I had for myself. When I was patient and waited for the light to get good again, that's when everything really changed. And I walked away with an image that I can be pretty proud of. So this photo I took five minutes before our last day of shooting wildlife came to an end. Anybody who knew me going into this trip knew that there was one animal that I wanted to see above all else. I wanted to see an African painted dog, 
also known as an African wild dog, also known as an African painted wolf. Um, they have a million different names. They're not hyenas. They are different than hyenas. Hyenas are actually more closely related to cats. Um, these African painted dogs are very closely related to the wolves that we see in North America. Um, they're kind of like the genetic offshoot of wolves that ended up on the African continent. They're a little bit smaller, but they are still quite large. Um, they are pack hunters. They are absolutely vicious, um, slightly terrifying animals for their their uh, their body weight. I mean, the way that they hunt is quite unlike any other animal I've ever seen. They're pretty brutal in their hunting tactics, and they're very very elusive, and they are just ridiculously beautiful. I wanted to see one so bad, so bad. Days went by, and a few more days went by, then a few more days went by, and it was the end of the trip, and we had one more day left in camp, but we were going to spend that day filming at camp, so we would have no more opportunities to see wildlife. We were driving back from our shoot, and I realized that there was one animal, just one animal I hadn't seen yet, and that was the, the one I wanted to see most, this, this painted dog. I was like, you know what? That's okay. I've seen elephants, I've seen giraffes, zebras, baboons, lions, everything else that I could have possibly asked for. This just gives me an opportunity to come back um, and focus on one specific subject next time around. We are literally five minutes, maybe less than that. We were within view of camp, coming around this bend in the road. My guide stops the vehicle and he looks down at the sandy road and he points out a track and then a few more tracks. It was the fresh tracks of a pack of wild dogs. And he was like, this is so fresh. I swear I can still smell the dogs. We're gonna follow these tracks. And he turned into the bush and we were totally bushwhacking in a vehicle through the forest. Sure enough, after a bit of driving, we had to drive for a while, we came upon the wild dogs. They had just finished eating on a carcass. We couldn't find the carcass, um, had walked a little ways away from it. And they were for the most part all laying in the sun resting. We pulled up beside them. And when we pulled up, this one stood up and kind of looked at us a little bit to check us out and see what we were up to. And then it laid back down. And that was it. I mean, my trip was made. This moment that happened in literally the last five minutes of shooting was the moment I had been dreaming about my entire life. And that gives me into this tip, which is never give up. Your moment will come. I think this is something um, when people ask me for tips about wildlife photography, I focus on tips like the ones I talked about earlier. But I think this is one that I need to start leading with a little bit more. Wildlife photography requires a tremendous amount of patience. I'd say the main reason why people give up eventually is because they feel like they don't have good enough luck. They're not getting the shots that they wanted. They're not seeing the animals that they hoped for. And it gets really, really frustrating. I've had, this past winter, I went four months, four months without getting a shot that I was proud of. And that wasn't for lack of trying. I was in the field five to six days a week, every week for that entire four months. And I still just couldn't walk away with that good moment, that good photo. It happens to everyone, whether you're a professional shooting on safari or you're a completely brand new wildlife photographer photographing animals in your backyard. Never ever get so frustrated that you put the camera down forever. Remind yourself constantly that eventually your moment will happen. Probably when you least expect it, when this wild dog encounter happened, I had put my camera in my backpack and was like, that's it. I'm done for this trip. That's it. I'm not going to see these animals. And then sure enough, we did. So hopefully um, you guys learned a little bit of something. Hopefully you got a little bit inspired by that last tip. And now we're going to lead into some questions. I'm going to have Michelle hop back on just because I haven't been able to see you guys' questions as they popped up. So she'll read them to me um, and we'll go from there. Oh, my light is so bright. <laughs> that was beautiful. Seriously, those images were amazing. I'm going to get rid of your slideshow so we can go through some questions. Um, I'm going to scroll back through them because most of the comments have actually been, oh my gosh, these are amazing. Somebody also says that you use the force <laughs> to get animals. <laughs> uh, Here's a good one in relation to what you were just talking about. How many times have you missed that greatest shot and ran out of patience? That is such a good question. Um, all the time. Actually, I have a little bit of a reputation. I have a reputation among the other wildlife photographers that I shoot with for being the person who misses the shot the most. Um, 
I am really impatient, especially by wildlife photographer st standards. People say all the time, like, oh, you must be so patient, Brooke. Oh, you wait for hours to get the shot. Really, I'm like a squirrel. I'm just distracted constantly. Um, I miss the shot primarily because I get impatient and I'm like, okay, you know what? This isn't happening anytime soon. You know what? I'll put it into context. So while I was in Alaska, my friends and I were photographing an eagle. The eagle was really close to us. It was like the perfect frame, everything you dream about. We were waiting for the moment for the eagle to take flight. We stood there for about 35 minutes and the eagle was not flying away. I dropped my camera down because my back's starting to get a little bit tired. I want to make a joke. So I like put the camera down so I can get my body language right to make a funny joke. I make the joke. I do my finger guns and the eagle flies away. And I didn't get the shot that I waited so long for because I oh, kind of no. thought like, eh, this moment's not going to happen. Whatever. I'm going to, I'm going to let myself be distracted now. Um, I also missed the shot because I just wasn't paying enough attention. There's been so many times that I've had my camera up and ready to go. The animal does the thing I was waiting for. And I like wasn't mentally all there and I didn't hit the shutter in time and I missed the moment. So it happens all the time, constantly, more than I'd admit. Sometimes a really good joke is just better than getting an eagle shot, you know? <laughs> I feel it's that I do. <laughs> I'm convinced it was the finger guns that made it take flight. It was like, ah, it's like, stop pointing that at me, Brooke. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So, so I know we've talked about this before when we did home with Olympus uh, and me with the wildlife one, because you had your list of your wish list animals, but somebody just asked, what's the next animal you're looking forward to catching to mountain lion? I am. Ashamed <laughs> you still of haven't got it. Still haven't gotten it. Oh my God. I'm ashamed of the fact that I photographed African lions before I photographed mountain lions when I have mountain lions literally in my backyard. So to anybody who doesn't know, I have spent this entire summer while I've been present in the lower 48 using a uh, remote camera trap. So this is an Olympus camera rigged to a motion sensor, rigged to some flashes set up on tripods in the woods where I'm not present to try to photograph a mountain lion as it walks past, you know, the motion sensor will pick up the mountain lion, the flashes will go off if it's nighttime or even if it's daytime and capture a photo of a mountain lion. And I am just failing miserably left and right. Actually, the most recent thing that happened was the water level rose really high and uh, it didn't wash away my gear, but it rose enough that all the tripods fell over and everything fell down. Oh my God. And I have not, it's been like months of trying. I have not gotten my photo of a mountain lion. At one point I did even have a mountain lion knock over the whole camera and chew on it a little bit. So that's still my white whale. I'm still trying. That is literally like my favorite Instagram saga. Like every time you bring it back up, I'm like, is she going to get the photo of this one? No. Yeah. And it, it, like, it hurts me deeply every time you go into like an Instagram story talking about what happened that made it not work. And I'm like, poor it's Brooke. Never ending. It's never ending. Anybody who wants to tune in, I'm actually going to be setting up my mountain lion cam again this weekend. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, if you don't follow Brooke's Instagram stories, they're great. There's tons of tips on tracking animals and identifying um, their their footprints and things like that. And the truly tragic saga of her trying to get a photo of this mountain lion. So another question, and I'm, I'm any setting presets, and I'm thinking probably we're talking about, do you have anything set on like your custom dials or something like that, that you jump to automatically? So this is a great question. Um, the answer up until very recently was no, I'd never done that. I was really like stuck in my ways. I'm so stubborn. And I was like, I don't need presets. Presets would confine me into only shooting using certain settings and I'm more free spirited and fluid minded than that. While I was actually in Africa, my guide, he's a really big birder. I mean, like really big birder. His knowledge was so impressive. He's also a photographer. He was also shooting with Olympus cameras. And he had a preset, you know, for his bird photography. And I, I watched him go from shooting. We were photographing zebras. And all of a sudden, a kingfisher that had been kind of flitting around behind the zebras took flight right toward us. And he switched the dial into a custom mode. All of a sudden, he was in bird mode. Boom, boom, boom. Got the shot. Switched back to normal. Kept on photographing the zebras. And I was like, it's the smartest thing I've ever seen in my life. So I have not gotten around to setting up my bird preset yet. But I... After watching today's um, presentation earlier about bird photography, I wrote down the settings that I should use for a bird preset, and I'm going to go ahead and, and do that. But up until now, no, I've, I've never had a preset on my camera. 
Yeah, I waited way too long to do that and missed so many awesome shots because I photographed the birds in the yard all the time and we yeah. get lots of hawks here. And I would have to like switch all my settings and then by then the hawk's already flown away and I've missed it. And so finally, exactly. like I watched Steve Ball's episode of Home with Olympus, or I was helping that one. And I was like, you know what? I'm doing it tonight. I am going to commit to making my custom menu for the birds in flight. <laughs> yep, I'm All finally right. going to do it. All right. So Emily wants to know, is there any tracking tips you learned during your first safari? Did you learn anything new while you guys were out there? Yes. Emily, awesome question. So I referenced this a little bit earlier. One of the things that I've struggled with the most in my tracking knowledge is aging a set of tracks. It's kind of easy to do when an animal's walking through snow, right? Like you can look at the ice crystals, see how much is melted. Um, that's a little bit more straightforward. But when you're tracking an animal that's walked on a substrate that's dry, so like dirt or the forest floor, it can be really difficult to tell how fresh its tracks are. My guides taught me to look at the insect tracks that crisscross an animal's tracks. So. For example, the wild dog tracks that we saw that were super fresh, those had been made like minutes before we came across them. Virtually no time for an ant to walk across the road and walk across that track. Set of lion tracks that we saw earlier in the day had been in place overnight. When we looked closely at the tracks, there were beetle footprints and ant footprints and other tiny, actually there were even bird footprints on top of the track. That indicated a good amount of time, enough time for these insects to be moving around, enough time for these birds to be landing on the ground. My guides were actually so knowledgeable that they were able to look at the tracks of the bird on top of the lion tracks, determine that this is a bird that only flies, uh, it's crepuscular, so it only flies in the evenings and mornings, and indicate that this track had been there since at least the evening before, based on the wow. bird having landed on it. So it was just cool. I've never used other tracks as context to age or determine any information about my primary focus set of tracks. So that was like the coolest tidbit. That's amazing. I would amazing. have never thought that you could use ant tracks to right? tell, right? tell the time. There's actually a really silly photo that the film crew took of me and my guide. We're looking at the ground. He's pointing at the tracks and he's showing me the ant tracks. And we both have these big, huge, cheesy grins on our face. And the photo just looks absurd. Like, why are these people smiling so hard at the ground? But because I was having this absolute like aha moment. I was like, <laughs> so hard. That is amazing. So somebody is now curious, what remote trigger are you using for your mountain lion trigger box? I am using two different types. Um, one is a homemade remote trigger sensor that somebody, uh, a friend of a friend made in their garage. And it's actually amazing. The other one is a Camtraption's PIR sensor. Um, PIR stands for something infrared. Both of them are super awesome. The Camtraption's one is nice because it's, um, you know, it's like static, it's movable. I can like place it further up the trail so that it can capture an animal walking towards me. Like it'll trigger when the animal's further out. The, uh, the homemade sensor actually does have to be plugged into the camera. So it sits right underneath my camera. And I can't like strategically arrange it, but it's nice to have both. So the animal, theoretically, if a mountain lion ever complied with me, the mountain lion could trigger the first, <laughs> you know, the first uh, sensor. I'd get that photo. And then when it got really close in, I would get another photo. Got the sensors and the camera all set up. Just add mountain lion. You're going to have to let me know when you actually get this shot. And we're going to have to have like a celebratory special edition live stream yeah, where yeah. we just talk about <laughs> We really Brooke are. finally got the mountain lion. <laughs> and just for anyone listening to, just to add a little bit of detail to this, I also have hunting cameras, like trail cameras set up in the area recording video. They also get motion triggered. So I have all this video indicating that I'm not an idiot. I'm setting up my camera in the right place because there are mountain lions galore. They're just walking everywhere except for where I need them to walk. They're walking behind the camera. They're sitting right next to it and licking their paws while looking directly at it. But they're not in the line of focus for the camera. So I'm not getting any photos. Someday it's going to happen, I okay. believe. So I know the answer to this already, but you know, some people here might not know. Do you like to use ProCapture? I live in ProCapture. Like I said earlier, I miss a lot of shots because I wasn't paying enough attention. By the time the animal does the thing that I was hoping it would do, takes flight, catches a fish, yawns, my brain is like lagging and I push the shutter way too late. I try to live in pro capture mode so that I'm always ready to go. Um, even if I'm not ready to go. 
Uh, I love pro capture mode, especially for animals because they're so unpredictable and I always exactly. miss the shot. I am, I'm not a good, like, <laughs> I'm always Honestly, like a millisecond delayed. So pro capture is my favorite. <laughs> it's, it's literally us proof. Yeah, right. Um, I really like this this question. I think it's really great. Um, how much of being a good wildlife photographer is finding animals versus being a master of your camera and photography? This is such a great question. Thank you for asking this, Emily. I love this. Um, I would say the biggest part about being a wildlife photographer is mastering photography in general. Um, honestly, mastering your camera and being familiar and comfortable with it is definitely pretty important. But I would rank that as the second most important thing. And then your subjects is the third most important thing, as counterintuitive as that sounds. Anyone can take a picture of a deer. Anyone. You can stand shoulder to shoulder with six different people and you can all take the same photo of the deer. In order for your photo to stand out, um, you have to have a masterful understanding of what makes a good composition. That's why when I do these presentations, they're very much less focused on finding your subject choosing your subject and choosing your settings and so heavily prioritizing the compositional techniques that I think really make your work that much more unique um, and that much more likely to stand out in the crowd. Like I said a little bit earlier, I think I said it, I'd rather photograph the squirrel in the good light than the lion in the harsh light because you're just going to end up with that better composition in the end. So I have one question. Uh, was it hard to travel overseas with COVID testing? Did you have to get tested beforehand? Was that stressful? It was so stressful. That was a great question too. So actually while I was there, um, this I was there in early July. So that's when the Delta variant like really started to catch on. Like after I had already arrived in Africa and had been there for like almost a week, all of a sudden all these new Delta variant concerns were popping up. So it was relatively easy to get there. Things got pretty hard when it came time to leave. We actually, because of the time requirements of when I would need to present a uh, negative COVID test to one of the airlines I was flying with, it needed to be within like 36 hours of my time of boarding my flight. I needed to have these results. And because I was like flying on a bush plane to a smaller plane to a slightly bigger plane and then to the main plane where I needed to present those results, like time was of the essence and we were finding it stressful. Like we weren't really going to get time to have a COVID test done. They actually had to helicopter a nurse into the bush to do the COVID test for myself and a few other individuals that were flying out on the same day. It was like a scene out of an action movie. This helicopter lands in the middle of the bush. You can hear lions roaring in the distance. This woman steps out. She's got her PPE on, PPE on fully gowned, masked, everything. Opens up this briefcase full of COVID tests and just one by one tested all the guests, get back in her, her helicopter and just flies off to her next camp to go do the same thing. Crazy. That's that is insane. It That's insane. crazy. Well, I'm glad you made it back and <laughs> everything Thanks. worked out. <laughs> Thanks, so in the essence of time, everyone, I know that we love talking with Brooke and we love having her on the show. And um, we're going to be very looking forward to her Mountain Lion special edition show when it happens. Um, but we do have another presentation coming up in one hour. It's our final presentation of the day with Peter Baumgarten which if you've never seen one of his presentations, they're absolutely phenomenal. Amazing. Phenomenon? Phenomenon. <laughs> it's an absolute phenomenon. <laughs> I've been up too long today, so I'm gonna go take a little break and thank you all for joining us on World Photography Day. And thank you, Brooke, for sharing your stories with the um, Wilderness Safaris. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. We'll see you in an hour. Thank you, everyone.